Okay, <laughs> everybody. Uh, we are talking about those eleven systems, right? Yeah. And we will start from there where we stopped in last class. We talked about the integumentary system, uh, muscular system, skeletal system, nervous system, and endocrine system. So today, first we'll talk about the cardiovascular system. Cardiovascular system consists of cardio means heart and vascular means blood vessels. So heart and the blood vessels are the parts of the cardiovascular system. Now blood vessels, when we say blood vessels, blood vessels there are different types, arteries, veins and capillaries. All those are blood vessels. Now, the function of the cardiovascular system, heart pumps the blood and because of that pumping action of the heart, blood circulates throughout the body. So, by the pumping action of the heart, blood circulates throughout the body but inside the blood vessels. Why blood needs to circulate? You already know that blood transports gases, right? Oxygen, carbon dioxide. Blood transports hormones, nutrients, metabolic toxic chemicals, all those things are transported by the blood from one place to another. You know, after you eat food, the nutrients from the intestine is absorbed by the blood, right? Taken by the blood and nutrients must be given to the body, right? To the tissue. After you inhale the oxygen, oxygen is taken by the blood from the lung and given to the tissues. When metabolism produces toxic chemicals, those toxic chemicals are harmful for the body, so blood take them from the tissue to the kidneys. So kidneys can produce urine and excrete them. So you see, who transports all those chemicals? Blood. Okay? That's why blood needs continuous motion, circulation. If blood stops circulating, those chemicals will not be transported. The person will not survive. <coughs> okay. So that motion of the blood inside the cardiovascular system is very important. Lymphatic system. This system is responsible for immunity. That means defensive functions of your body. Now, first we'll see the parts of the lymphatic system. Lymphatic system consists of lymph organs. Large lymph organs are tonsils, spleen, and thymus. These are large lymphatic organs. Small lymphatic organs are 
lymph nodes. Okay, lymph nodes, tiny round structures throughout the lymphatic system. <coughs> Large lymphatic organs are only few in number. Your thymus is only one, tonsils are few, spleen is one. So they are very few in number. But lymph nodes are plenty, many. Throughout the lymphatic system, you have many lymph nodes. In particular areas of your body, you know, cervical area, axillary area, inguinal area, in those areas, you have more clustered lymph nodes, right? That's why doctors, if you go, uh, sometimes we we'll quickly check those areas if you have any enlargement of lymph nodes, right? So, in those areas, you have more lymph nodes. Another difference between large and small lymph organs, large lymph organs are responsible for immunity, but they also have other functions. But lymph nodes are solely responsible for immunity. They don't have other functions. Okay. For example, uh, in a spleen, spleen is responsible for immunity, but also spleen is the site where red blood cells, old blood cells are destroyed. So, it has a different function. Chimus. Chimus is responsible for immunity, but it also helps in maturation of white blood cells. So, they have immune function, but also other functions. But lymph nodes are solely responsible for immunity. They don't have other functions. Anyway, so those are the lymph organs. Then, Lymphatic vessels. Lymphatic system is a circulatory system like cardiovascular system. We know that cardiovascular system is a circulatory system, right? Blood circulates inside it. Lymphatic system is also a circulatory system. That's why it has vessels, lymphatic vessels. And the largest lymphatic vessels are called trunks. Oh, sorry, largest lymphatic vessels are called ducts. D U C T S ducts. Okay. So ducts are largest. There are two ducts in the lymphatic system. And also there are trunks. Collecting vessels and capillaries, lymphatic capillaries. These capillaries are different than blood capillaries. So these are the lymphatic vessels, ducts, trunks, collecting vessels and capillaries. So within these lymphatic vessels, the fluid that circulates, that is called the lymph. So, fluid is the lymph. Okay. This is kind of transparent whitish fluid uh, that circulates inside the lymphatic system. So, these are the parts of the lymphatic system. Just know that inside the lymphatic system, you have the lymphocytes and antibodies. Huge amount of lymphocytes and antibodies are present inside the lymphatic system. And these two 
components are the main warriors against the antigens or microorganisms that try to invade into your body. So, these two components are the main warriors or fighters against the antigens or microorganisms that invade into your body. Okay? And they circulate inside the lymphatic system. Okay, the respiratory system. <coughs> respiratory system consists of a number of structures. If we start from the top, nose is the uppermost organ, you all know that. Inside the nose, you have nasal cavity. Okay? And then, after that, you have pharynx, then larynx, trachea, then trachea divides into main or principal bronchi and those two enter into the lung. Okay? After the bronchi, bronchus is singular. If I indicate only one of those two, it is bronchus. If I say both, bronchi, C-H-I. So, bronchi is plural, bronchus is singular, one. So, nose, nasal cavity, pharynx, larynx, trachea. You need to know these in correct order. Then, the lower end of trachea divides. This is the trachea, lower end divides into two. These are main bronchi. This is right bronchus, this is left bronchus. And they then enter into the lung. Enter into the lung. And inside the lung, they again and again divide. Like the branch of the tree. You know, branch of the tree divides again and again like that. From larger branches, you get it smaller, and that way, inside the lung, the bronchus divides to many divisions. And the last structures here are tiny air valves, those are called alveoli. Okay? So, alveoli. So, finally, the gas or air that you inhale reaches to the alveoli, arrives in the alveoli. That's the last structure. So, again, nose, nasal cavity, then pharynx, then larynx, then trachea. Trachea divides into two main bronchi and then those main bronchi enter into the lungs and divide further again and again and then finally the last structures are alveolar. So that's the, those are the parts of the respiratory system. Now, the respiratory system uh, helps you to inhale and excel the gas or air. So, with the help of the respiratory system, we inspire or inhale the air from outside to inside the lung and also we expel or expire the air from the lung to the outside. That we all know, right? Your respiratory system does it. But, after you inhale the air into your lung, Inside the lung, what happens? In this alveoli, what happens? Gas exchange occurs. That is another important function. Gas exchange. What is the gas exchange? From the alveoli, oxygen goes to the blood and from the blood, carbon dioxide enters into the alveoli. So, in opposite direction. Oxygen goes to the blood and carbon dioxide from blood to the alveoli of the lung. And that is the gas exchange. Okay? So, 
two important functions of respiratory system I will mention. One is, you all know, inspiration and expiration of air, right? Inhaling, inhalation and exhalation of air that you see. But inside the lung, what happens? Gas exchange occurs between the alveoli and the blood. From the alveoli, oxygen goes to the blood because blood goes to the lung to get the oxygen. You all know that, right? Blood goes to the lung to get what? Oxygen. So, blood will get oxygen from the lung and give carbon dioxide to the lung. So, we expel carbon dioxide out. <coughs> Digestive system. Digestive system has two types of organs. If you divide the entire digestive system organs, we divide them into two parts. One is called GI tract or gastrointestinal tract. This tract is a long tube from mouth to the anus. Okay? So, mouth to Anus. This is a long tube and that is GI tract. Now, you know the GI tract, the size of a diameter of GI tract changes. After your mouth, you have esophagus here, right? Esophagus takes the food to the stomach, you know that. And Esophagus is a narrow tube, narrow tube, then stomach is what, right. very wide, you know, right, stomach is wide, then again you get a small intestine which is very long and narrow, make sense, and then it again gets wider to form the large intestine, so you see it is a continuous tube, but in some places it is narrow, some places it is what, right. wider. So that's the GI tract. So uh, GI tract has different parts starting from the mouth, then pharynx, then esophagus, then uh, stomach, small intestine, large intestine. Then accessory organs. Those are not parts of GI tract, those are outside of the GI tract, outside of the, that tube. What are the accessory organs of this system? Liver, pancreas, gallbladder. So these are the accessory organs of the digestive system. They help in digestion, but they are not a part of this tube. They are located outside of the tube. Liver helps in metabolism, pancreas produces digestive juice, gallbladder helps in the secretion of bile, which is very important for fat digestion and absorption. So all these are helping the process of or functions of digestive system. Okay, so those are the parts of your <coughs> digestive system. Now I'll mention the important functions of this system. Since the name of this system is digestive system, one important function is digestion. Right? Digestion of the food. So, what is digestion? Number one function digestion and digestion is simple, very simple. Breakdown of food. So, digestion is the process of breakdown of food. Now, the question is why you need to break the food. When you eat something, burger, right, you start to break the food. 
So digestion starts where? Inside the mouth, right? You crush the food, right? Chop the food. Then salivary secretion occurs, right? So that means what? The chemicals are secreted. So chemical digestion also occurs in the mouth. So mechanical digestion is what? You crush the food with teeth, right? Grind the food with teeth. That is by pressure, right? So that is mechanical. Also, saliva contains the chemicals that helps in breakdown of food. That is chemical digestion. So anyway, so breakdown of the food is digestion. Now finally, when the food stuff reaches to the small intestine, what happens? The food is now are in very fine molecular states. So the food, large food has turned to molecules, small molecules because of that breakdown, continuous breakdown process. Okay? And those food molecules are called nutrients. So what are the nutrients? We very often hear the term nutrients, right? Nutrients are fine food molecules. So when the food reaches to the small intestine, already the food stuffs are nutrients, fine molecules, right? Then what happens next? Blood in the intestinal wall absorbs takes the nutrients from the intestine into the blood. So that is called absorption. So after digestion, next is the absorption. What is absorption? Nutrients, the process by which the nutrients are taken into the blood from the intestine. Make sense? The absorption is the process by which nutrients are taken into the blood from where? From the intestine. <coughs> Which is very important because nutrients must enter into the body, enter into the blood and that is the absorption. Mm -hmm. Then after absorption, the nutrients are taken to the liver. Most of the nutrients go to the liver. And what happens? Metabolism occurs in the liver. Metabolism requires nutrients. So, metabolism. Since liver is also part of digestive system, the function of liver is metabolism of nutrients and that produces ATP, energy. So, Metabolism is the process by which nutrients are converted to ATP. So that's why you need nutrients in your body. Nutrients will enter into metabolic process and ATPs are produced. And <clears throat> those foodstuffs remain in the intestine, those are not taken into the blood, those will get out from the body as feces and that process is called excretion as feces. So unused stuffs, unabsorbed stuffs will remain in the intestine, from the small intestine will go to the large intestine and then will get out from the body as feces. So that is the excretion. So I mentioned four important functions. Digestion, absorption, metabolism and excretion. Okay? So remember those are the functions of the digestive system. Urinary system. Urinary system is the main excretory system of your body. Why? Because most of the toxic chemicals, those are produced in your body, are eliminated or excreted out from the body through the urinary system. The urinary system excretes most of the toxic chemicals of your body through the urine. 
Now, this system consists of two kidneys located in the lumbar area. We have learned that in last lab here, in the back lumbar area. And then from two kidneys, two tubes, narrow tubes, go to the bladder, urinary bladder. Those tubes are called ureters ureters and then you have the bladder and last part is the urethra from the bladder to the outside of the body. So those are the parts. Kidneys, if I ask you in one sentence, tell me what's, what's the function of the kidney? Simplest answer will be production of urine. Kidneys produce urine. Okay, kidneys produce urine. Uh, <clears throat> then, ureters, those narrow tubes, transport the urine from the kidney to the bladder. Take the urine from the kidney to the bladder. And bladder holds the urine for hours, few to several hours. You know that. Bladder holds the urine and when you desire you urinate so the urine from the bladder goes to the atmosphere outside of the body through the urethra so urethra is the last part that takes the urine from the bladder to the outside of the body to the environment now this part is different in male and female urethra. Male urethra is long and female urethra is very short. Male urethra is about 15 to 20 centimeter long but female urethra is only 3 to 4 centimeter long. Other parts are same. Uh, anyway, so those are the parts of the urinary system. Now, I mentioned already that main function is excretion of toxic chemicals, right? That's the main function of the urinary system. But urinary system also has other functions. Regulation of water and electrolytes in your body. How? It's very simple. You all know. If I ask you to drink a lot of water now, water will enter into the body, right? And your blood volume will go up. Make sense? Water will go to the blood and blood volume will go up. So, which is not needed. So, your kidneys will do what? Produce more urine. Make sense? More urine will be produced to <coughs> excrete excessive water out from the body. Make sense? That extra amount of water that you have taken, your body doesn't need, kidneys will do what? Excrete them by producing more urine. Is it clear? So you see how kidneys regulate the water in the body. If you don't drink water for a couple of days, kidneys will do what? Will produce very highly concentrated urine. Will not let the water get out from the body. Try to keep the water inside. Right? So kidneys regulate the water volume and by regulating that, it also regulates the blood pressure. If you know someone gets high blood pressure, one very commonly used medicine is that's um, called hydrochlorothiazide that produces more urine. So by producing more urine, the blood volume goes down. Make sense? Water from the blood gets out and blood pressure goes down. More blood volume is more pressure. Less blood volume, less pressure. Make sense? So, in that way, kidneys also, urinary system also regulates the blood pressure by regulating the volume of blood. Electrolytes. 
if you take too much salt, sodium chloride, you know salt, you will see that in your urine more salt is getting out. Okay, so those are the electrolytes, sodium chloride. After you eat sodium chloride, that's the salt inside the body, it becomes electrolytes. So if you take more, then more electrolytes will be in the blood and kidneys will excrete them out. So that way kidneys or urinary system is always trying to maintain the electrolytes. If any electrolyte concentration is high, excretion will be more. Acid base balance, another very important function of the urinary system. How? Very simple. By regulating hydrogen ion concentration. So this one <coughs> is responsible for acid base balance. If in your blood hydrogen ion concentration increases, that is called acidosis, which is not good. Blood becomes acidic. Acidosis means blood is more acidic. If hydrogen ion concentration in your blood goes down, that is called alkalosis. These are not good. So, the hydrogen ion concentration must be constant. And now, very simple. If in your blood hydrogen ion concentration increases, acidosis occurs, urinary system will excrete that excess hydrogen ion from the body and concentration will go down. If hydrogen ion concentration is less, in that case urinary system will not let the hydrogen ion get out through the urine, will preserve. So, gradually hydrogen ion concentration will go up. So just to know that, that acid base ba balance that is controlled by the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. Okay? If hydrogen ion concentration is more, that you have to remember, it is called acidosis. That means acidic. More hydrogen is more acidic. Less hydrogen is more alkaline. Okay? So, yes. That's all happening in the kidneys? Uh, that is one way by excreting. That's the simplest way. But inside your blood, you have buffers. Inside your body, you have several buffer systems. Those buffers will also try to neutralize. The function of buffer, you know, maintaining the pH, right? Will not let the hydrogen ion concentration change. Uh, so, buffers are always working inside the body. Okay? Uh, Reproductive system. Reproductive system is the most interesting system of the body. This is the only system which is completely different in male and female body. Other systems are same. Very small differences, but this system is completely different in male and female, right? And <clears throat> reproductive system is responsible for a number of things. First, production of offspring, that's the reproduction, production of new life, right? By producing sperm and ovum. Reproductive system produces new life. You know that sperm fertilizes the egg and that is the first cell of new life, right? That fertilized egg multiplies to form the embryo and fetus. So that is a very important function of the reproductive system. Uh, reproductive system produces sex hormones and sex hormones have important functions, you know that sexual desire and drive 
those are controlled by the hormones, right? Hormones control them. Uh, secondary sex characteristics are given by the sex hormones. What are the secondary sex characteristics? Those are the characteristics separate a man and a woman, a boy and a girl externally. How you can tell this is a boy, this is a girl? Because of secondary sex characteristics. Make sense? So external features. Those are the secondary sex characteristics given by the hormones, sex hormones. So two important things are produced by the reproductive system. Number one, sex cells or gametes, sperm and ovum. And number two, sex hormones. Male sex hormone testosterone, female sex hormone estrogen, progesterone. So those are the most two most important function. Production of sperm and ovum, production of sex hormones, male and female sex hormones. Now, hormones give secondary sex characteristics. Uh, so how, if I ask you what are the male secondary sex characteristics, by looking at those from outside, you can tell this is a male. You all know, right? Tell me. Name couple of male secondary sex characteristics. How a girl and a boy can be separated from outside. Right? Facial hair? Yeah, very good. It's allowed. You know. What do you think? Yes, external genitalia, but there are other stuff, you don't have to go that deep. How would boys, how would boys, is different or same? How is boys? Deeper in boys, right? How about uh, mm, muscles? Skeletal muscles, more or less in male, more prominent, right? Skeletal muscles. How about uh, you should all know that? How about um, what is this? Yeah, that is prominent in male, right? That's one secondary sex characteristics. Laryngeal prominence. Uh, common people say Adam's apple. Laryngeal prominence, right? So, uh, broader shoulder, baldness, all those are due to male sex hormone. Female secondary sex characteristics are what? Female. What are the female sec secondary sex characteristics? So the characteristics that separates a male and female externally. So females look different than male, right? How females look different than male? Yes, broader hip, yes. Female breast, right? Fat under the skin, subcutaneous fat is more. That's why skin looks smooth, right? More subcutaneous fat. High pitch voice, right? Not deep, not loud. Yeah, so those are the female secondary sex characteristics. Now, if a female starts to take the testosterone, male sex hormone, right? You'll see slowly male features start to grow, right, in female body. That tells what? That tells that sex hormones are responsible for that. Okay? Those secondary sex characteristics. <coughs> the parts of male 
reproductive system. External genitalia includes penis and scrotum. Those two structures are together called external genitalia. Then other structures are testis, ductus deferens, ductus means duct, tube, ductus deferens, prostatic gland. So those are some important organs of male reproductive system. In female, <coughs> you have uh, ovaries, uterus, vagina, uterine tube, and also external genitalia, they in a show here, that includes labias majus, labias minus, uh, those are external genitalia, and mammary glands, female breast. Okay, uh, so now we are done with those 11 systems. You have learned two things, right? Mainly the parts of each of those 11 systems and important functions of those systems. Uh, now briefly, we'll talk about the necessary life functions. What are the functions necessary for the life? One is maintaining boundaries. Two types of boundaries are important in your body. One boundary is microscopic boundary, very tiny, but billions. What are those cell membranes? You know, you have hundreds of billions of cells in your body, and those cells have boundaries or membrane. So, the cell membrane is one type of boundary which is microscopic and separates inside the cell from outside and this is very important. <coughs> Another boundary is the large structure that is the skin that covers the whole body and separates the whole body from outside. So these are two types of boundaries, cell membrane and the skin. Cell membrane is also called plasma membrane, same thing. Movement or contractility. You all know that movement is essential for your life. How? Just think that. After you put food in your mouth, what happens? You chew the food, right? And then food starts to move downwards, right? Goes to the stomach and then to the intestine. And gradually the food stuff is moving down. That movement is essential, right? If food stays in your mouth, you won't survive. So food is moving down because of the contraction of the gastrointestinal tract. So movement is very important. Your heart is continuously moving. Your lung is expanding and contracting, relaxing and contracting. So all those movements you see are essential. <coughs> uh, responsiveness. Your body must be able to respond to a stimulus. Must be able to respond to a stimulus. If something very hot touches your skin, right? You move the body away. So stimulus is the hot and response is the movement. You are moving away, right? You are responding. How? By moving your hand away. So that responsiveness happens in many, many ways. For example, this is external stimulus coming from outside. You are moving your body part away. So that's the response. Let me give you internal stimulus. <coughs> okay? If 
your body temperature increases like you have done workout exercise what happens body temperature increases right how your body will respond to that environment by producing sweat right you know that your body will release sweat sweating occurs to do what to reduce the body temperature make sense so your body is responding the heat is being produced in the body so body is responding to reduce it how by releasing sweat sweating so there are hundreds of examples i can give that how your body responds to changed environment when you do exercise your heart rate increases why because it is needed your tissue needs more oxygen right so heart will pump more blood if you do exercise heart doesn't pump more then your tissue will suffer from lack of oxygen right will not get enough oxygen so you see your body is responding by increasing the pumping action of the heart to increase the blood flow digestion <coughs> uh, i have already mentioned digestion is the breakdown of food which is very important because blood cannot absorb large food pieces blood can only take when the food becomes nutrients the fine molecules by digestion by breakdown otherwise food will not be able to enter into the blood metabolism i have also mentioned this one metabolism of nutrients produces atp that gives the energy so metabolism produces atp or energy from the food or nutrients excretion unwanted or toxic stuffs of your body must be eliminated must get out how by excretion by excretion of feces by excretion of urine so excretion is very important if your kidney stops working then what will happen toxic chemicals will not be able to get out right so it will accumulate in your body and will cause harm to the internal organs make sense the systems will fail because of toxicity so you see how very important the excretion is if excretion does it work then inside your body the toxic chemicals will accumulate reproduction in biology reproduction refers two kinds of reproduction one is we all know right production of new life sperm fertilizes the egg and we get new life right so that is one type of reproduction another type of reproduction in biology is called cellular reproduction what is that you know inside your body multiplication of cells occur right cells multiply you know mitosis meiosis have you heard that so those are cellular reproduction one cell produces two two cell produces four four produces eight those are cellular reproduction <coughs> cellular reproduction is necessary why just let me give you an example your red blood cells die after 3 to 4 months the life span of red blood cell is only 3 to 4 months so after the old red blood cells die after 3 or 4 months your bone marrow needs to produce new cells right to replace them so continuously new cells are being produced when you drink hot coffee some cells are always dying in the mouth inner lining of the mouth those cells are dying although you don't see but if you drink very hot you will eventually fail uh, the taste of food is not good right if you burn the mouth that means the cells are always dying 
those are very sensitive cells but quickly new cells are being produced Makes sense that's why you don't feel that skin you know old skin dies right cells die new skin is formed so cellular reproduction is occurring all the time to replace the old or dead cells growth of the organs of the body adequate growth is very important uh, you know during the growth of the body all individual organs each organ must get its proper size and structure your heart if the heart remains big or small will not be able to perform proper function okay big heart is not good small heart is not good so the size uh, normal growth is important to perform normal function it's true for all organs survival needs what are the stuffs we need to get from outside of the body every day you get nutrients that means food every day 24 hours every moment you get oxygen <coughs> even when you are sleeping so nutrients and oxygen those two things we must get from outside why because those are essential for metabolism those our body must get from outside for metabolism and metabolism occurs in the tissue and after metabolism we get what we get atp that gives the energy we get heat more metabolism more heat we you know that we get small amount of water these things are good but also we get what we get carbon dioxide and other metabolic waste these are harmful toxic so you see metabolism produces some good things as well as some bad things toxic things so these are used in your body you know your body temperature must be maintained otherwise chemical reactions will not occur we need heat in the body we need atp for movement or other physiological functions water is good for the body carbon dioxide and waste this must be excreted okay from the body carbon dioxide gets out through the respiratory system and other metabolic waste mostly get out through the urinary system some through the feces and other ways sweating uh water your body body's most abundant chemical is the water most common chemical of the body is the water and water helps in your body in many ways you know thousands of chemical reactions take place inside the body we don't see them but those are happening all the time and they are happening because the chemicals are dissolved in water if you have chemistry background you know if you put two dry chemicals together reaction usually doesn't occur right if you dissolve them in water make solution and then mix reaction occurs right so the chemicals of your body are dissolved in water and that helps in chemical reactions so water is the <coughs> uh, site of chemical reactions in your body uh, water has other important functions we'll talk about that later 
uh, normal body temperature. This is also very important that I mentioned here a little bit that heat is very important. If your body temperature goes down, that is called hypothermia. The patient may die because for chemical reactions, you need heat adequate or optimum temperature that is the body temperature if that optimum temperature is not there many chemical reactions will get stopped or slowed down so the body will not be able to function so that's why temperature is very important uh, appropriate atmospheric pressure this is simple you all know why we live at sea level because the pressure of oxygen is good for us, right? On the top of Mount Everest, you won't be able to survive because the pressure of oxygen, atmospheric pressure is different, right? You need to carry gas, oxygen. So, optimum pressure or appropriate atmospheric pressure uh, of gases is important for breathing. Okay. So those are uh, two things that are necessary for the life and survival. I explained how they are important. <coughs> so now we'll talk about a very important topic that is called homeostasis. Homeostasis. Okay, what is homeostasis? Homeostasis is maintaining internal body environment constant or unchanged. I am repeating again. Homeostasis is maintaining internal body environment unchanged or constant. So, uh, let me give you a couple of examples of homeostasis. I have already mentioned, if body temperature increases, what happens? Sorry, right? Because the water that leaves with sweat takes a lot of heat out from the body. Water has high heat capacity. Can Small amount of water can take hold lot of heat. So when sweating occurs, although small amount of water leaves the body, but that can take lot of heat out from the body. Make sense? So body temperature will be lower. So that is homeostasis. You are not doing that, right? Your body is doing. So your body is always trying to maintain internal environment unchanged or keep it constant. Uh, just opposite example, if your body temperature goes down, hypothermia, what happens? Shivering, right? Occurs. Muscle contraction, frequent muscle contraction occurs. To do what? To produce heat. To warm up your body. Make sense? So you see, if the body temperature goes up, sweating occurs to reduce it. If body temperature goes down, shivering occurs to bring it back to normal. Okay? So, those are the examples of homeostasis. Okay? <coughs> now, uh, this is the blood pH. The pH of blood is 7.35 to 7.45. So this is the lower limit. This is the upper limit of pH of blood. Now, the pH of blood must be within this narrow range. Always. Now, if for some reason 
they say the pH of blood is within, this is normal, within that range, that means normal. Now, if for some reason, the pH drops below 7.35, this is the lower limit. That is called what? Few minutes ago, I mentioned. Acidosis. Remember that? If pH goes down, that is called acidosis. Which is good or bad? Bad. So now, the body will do what? Will try to bring it back within the rays. And most of the cases, you must remember you are asking buffers, right? Inside the body, we have buffers. They bring the pH back to normal, right? That's the function of the buffer, maintaining the pH, right? Auto regulation. So buffers will start to work, right? Normally buffers will not work. When that will happen, buffers will work, right? To bring it back to normal. And most of the cases, it will go back to normal because we have buffers. Now, if the buffers fail, buffers are not working, then what will happen? Acidosis will occur and the person will have acidosis, that clinical condition, if the homeostasis is not maintained. This is homeostasis. If the homeostasis is not maintained, that becomes a disease, clinical condition. Most of the time, body brings the function back homeostasis is restored, restored, but sometimes the body cannot and in that case disease <coughs> occurs. Okay? If it goes up and your bumper <coughs> cannot bring down, that is alkalosis, which is not good either. So, you see that if homeostasis fails, that becomes disease. Okay? Same thing, heart rate. Your heart rate is 70 to 80 per minute. We know that. Now, if for any reason heart rate goes up to 150 and your nervous system cannot bring it back to normal, that is tachycardia, abnormal heartbeat. Okay? So, body always tries to bring the function back or keep the function within the normal range but not necessarily every time it can. When it cannot, homeostasis fails, that causes diseases. Okay? Now, uh, bringing back to normal is called feedback mechanism. Negative feedback. This is the most commonly used mechanism of homeostasis, negative feedback mechanism. When the pH goes down, buffers will bring it back to normal. When pH goes up, buffers will again try to bring it back to normal. In both cases, bringing back to normal is negative feedback mechanism. If body temperature increases, sweating occurs. Right? If body temperature increases, sweating occurs to bring back to normal. So that is also negative feedback. When body temperature decreases, shivering occurs to produce heat to bring the temperature back. That is also negative feedback. So you see, from both directions, bringing back to normal is negative feedback mechanism. So don't only think that negative is moving down, moving back to what? Normal. From high to low, low to high. Make sense? So that uh, don't confuse. Sometimes you may think negative, that means negative, bringing back to normal from high. No. Bringing back to normal it could be from high to low, low to high. Okay? But the purpose is bringing back to normal range, okay? 
negative feedback. <coughs> and most of the cases, homeostasis is restored by negative feedback mechanism. In few cases, positive feedback mechanism works. Only in few instances, for example, example of positive feedback. Positive feedback intensifies the process. Intensifies the process. Not necessarily bringing back to normal range. Let me give you an example. When you get a cut, what happens? Clot is formed. How? This is a cut you got here. This is the cut. So what happens? This surface gets rough. So platelets, one type of blood cells, get sticky. The surface get sticky and they start to get attached to each other and gradually it becomes bigger, larger and that seals the cut. So you see the clot is formed by the aggregation of platelets but slowly the clot gets bigger and bigger because of more and more platelets get attached to air. So this is an example of positive feedback mechanism. The size is getting bigger to complete a function. Now, another example, good example of positive feedback during delivery, child birth, you know, uterus contacts, right? So, first, uterus contacts weakly, then gradually the intensity increases, right? Force of contraction increases. So, when Weak contraction occurs, signal goes to the brain, brain sends signal back to the uterus and more stronger contraction occurs. This way, brain is every time sending signal back and telling to contact more forcefully. So you see, gradually, the force of contraction increases, intensifies. That is another example of positive feedback mechanism. And until the process is done, it will continue, right? So until the process is done, the clot size will get bigger and bigger. So those are the examples of positive feedback mechanism. Positive feedback mechanism could be harmful too. Not only always good. Very simple. When you get a cut, you need clot, right? To stop that bleeding. But if without any cut, Clot is formed inside the blood vessel. Is that good? No. No. Because that's, that can block the artery, right? That happens. That can block the artery. So, you see, positive feedback is not always good. It could be harmful, right? In this case, if the clot is formed without cut, positive feedback starts, then that can block the artery. You are pregnant, like two months. If uterus starts to contact, right? Positive feedback start to work. Then what will happen? The miscarriage, right? Abortion will occur. So, positive feedback could be harmful or helpful. Not necessarily always helpful. Make sense? There are three components of homeostasis. What are those three components? Receptors, control center, and effector. So those are three components. Two mechanisms. If I ask you how many mechanisms? Two. Negative and positive feedback. Those are mechanisms. Components are three. Receptors, control center, and effectors. So, In the body, you have temperature receptors. When body temperature increases, when body temperature increases, these receptors are activated because receptors are there to detect the change. So if the body temperature is high, the receptors will detect that. 
and will send signal to the control center because receptors can only detect and send signal nothing else they can do so control center is the brain or central nervous system central nervous system will receive that signal from the receptors and interpret that is it cold or hot if it is hot how much hot all those things are interpreted by the control center and then control center will send signal not to the receptors send signal to the sweat glands sweat glands and secretion of sweat will occur okay so receptors are detecting the change and sending signal to the brain brain will interpret that and send signal to the sweat glands and these are the effectors who will perform the action so remember effectors perform the action first the action sweating so that temperature will go down so that's the pathway of homeostasis those are three components must work receptors to detect control center to determine or interpret and sending signal to the effector and effector will perform the action so this know that two mechanisms three components and how they work this will you will understand the examples i have given already this example i have given so sweet this you will understand positive feedback i gave you the example of blood clot formation and uterine contraction right during childbirth 